This is going to be a study on the subject of enemies of the seven mysteries. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2 says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Many Christians today aren't faithful with the biblical mysteries. And if these mysteries aren't taught, then a false doctrine would just come up in their place. But number one, probably, probably the most important one, is the mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So this mystery is about Jesus Christ being God in the flesh. Did you know that many people don't realize that Jesus Christ is God? I've talked to many people about Jesus Christ. And when I say that Jesus Christ is God, they say, no, that's his son. But they don't realize that Jesus Christ being the son of God makes him equal with God and that Jesus Christ himself is God. And if Jesus Christ wasn't God, then he couldn't have rose from the dead and our faith would be vain. It's a mystery because the God who created everything came down in the flesh as a baby and grew up just like we did. He was fully God and fully man and faced all the troubles and trials we face. I don't completely understand uh, Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. I don't completely understand the Godhead. I don't completely understand how God is manifested in the flesh. That's because it's a mystery. And Luke 2.52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So Jesus Christ grew up just like we did. He started out as a baby. His mother took care of him. And he grew up just like a normal person. In Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he faced all the things that we face as humans. And the enemies to this mystery are religious groups like Islam and Judaism and any religion that doesn't believe Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. That's a false religion. The Jehovah's Witnesses is a false religion. They are enemy of the mystery. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. The new Bibles are enemies of this mystery. They would take out the word God from 1 Timothy 3.16 and replace it with the word He. And the verse will read, He was appeared in a body or something along those lines. A sneaky attack on the deity of Jesus Christ. The new versions will say He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. That's not true. If preachers and teachers had been faithful with this mystery, then you wouldn't have men like Martin Luther King Jr. denying the virgin birth, which he did. You wouldn't have the cult leaders denying that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. But mystery number two is Christ in you. The indwelling Christ. Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This mystery is about Jesus Christ living in every born-again believer. It is a mystery how Jesus Christ, who is God, could live in every believer at the same time. It is a mystery because Jesus Christ is living in a body that still sins on a daily basis. If you're a Christian, your standing in Christ is sinless, but your state is however you are living at any given moment. And you still sin. Even after you're saved, you still sin. You'll still commit sin. And Jesus Christ lives in you, lives in the Christian anyway. And 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? You take God with you everywhere you go. And in the enemies of this mystery are people who teach eternal insecurity, or once saved, not always saved. Uh, if you're a Bible believer, then you believe that the born-again Christian has eternal security. 
And if you don't believe that, then you're going to have to deny a whole bunch of verses in the Pauline epistles. Uh, Jesus Christ doesn't leave your body and come back and then leave again. He comes in and stays. And the holiness groups, the Church of God, the Methodists, they don't believe a man can sin and still keep his salvation. They don't understand the mystery of how Jesus Christ will dwell in a man who has sinful flesh. Romans eight thirty eight and 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So nothing can separate us from the love of God, and not just the love of God, but the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. If you're saved, you're in Christ Jesus. And if nothing can separate you from the love in Christ Jesus, then that means you can't get out of Christ. We are sealed into the day of redemption. And nothing can break that seal. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So if you're saved, you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is dwelling in you. And nothing can take him out. The devil can't take him out. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And people who teach eternal insecurity and that you can lose your salvation, they are enemies to this mystery. They are trying to bring you back under the law and keep you in bondage. They are trying to teach a works-based salvation. Just like they were saying in, in the book of Acts, you had to be circumcised and believe on Jesus Christ to be saved. Today, they'll say you have to be baptized They'll add baptism to the believing the gospel. They'll add, you name it, anything they'll name to the simple gospel. And ta uh, Paul talks about people confusing people about the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. But the next mystery, the third mystery we're going to talk about is the mystery of the blindness of Israel. And this is one that you really see heavily right now, a bunch of enemies of this mystery. People are really confused about Israel. They don't have a balanced view. Uh, Romans eleven twenty five through 26 says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, and to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So the mystery revealed is that God is not through with Israel. Many people today are teaching that God is done with Israel and that he replaced Israel with the church. But Israel as a nation is blind in part to the truth of Jesus Christ. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, there is going to be a remnant of Jews who will believe Jesus Christ is God and they will be saved. Enemies of this mystery are conceded according to verse 25. And those who teach replacement theology are enemies of this mystery. They teach the church replaces Israel. But Jesus Christ is coming back a second time, and all Israel shall be saved. Romans eleven twenty seven says, For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. If the church is Israel then how are we enemies concerning the gospel? That verse said that Israel is enemies concerning the gospel. We're not enemies to the gospel. If you're saved, you believe the gospel. You're trying to give out the gospel. You're trying to preach the gospel to every creature. Anyone who teaches that Israel is done away with, they're an enemy of this mystery. The self-proclaimed new independent fundamental Baptist movement, as they're, they so call themselves, they're plain, planting churches near you and teaching this replacement theology that the church replaced Israel. But this is very false doctrine. Now, a G, a Christ rejecting Jew is going to go to hell just like a Christ rejecting Gentile. Uh, nobody is teaching, I mean, there are people teaching this, but it's not a Bible believer teaching that that a Christ rejecting Jew is going to go to heaven just because he's a Jew. Each individual Jew who rejects Jesus Christ is going to hell. But as a nation, God is not done with Israel. 
and the church doesn't replace Israel. We don't get the covenant land grant and those physical promises that Israel got. But this remnant of saved Jews, they're going to get the physical promises that were promised to Abraham. They're going to get that physical land in the millennium when they are restored. But number four is the mystery of iniquity. And if you look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 8, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the mystery of iniquity is a man, it is the man of sin, who will become the son of perdition after he receives a deadly wound and raises from the dead to counterfeit the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a mystery because his spirit is already at work. His number will be 666, and he will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or their forehead. And people who are enemies of this mystery don't acknowledge the warning about this man and they're seeking a person to solve their problems outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. People are already looking for somebody that will solve the world's problems. A superhuman type person. And they're looking for someone with superior knowledge to come in and solve the world's problems and make peace. And the book of Daniel says that the Antichrist will come in peaceably and by peace shall destroy many. He will say peace, peace when there is no peace. And many don't acknowledge this mystery and will deny the Antichrist spirit in things like the contemporary Christian music scene. And the contemporary crowd are getting all, all the people together, getting everyone together, ecumenical movement. That's why they support new Bibles. They support the Pope and other wicked men. If people were faithful and preaching this mystery, the mystery of iniquity, the coming Antichrist who wants to get everyone together, he's going to start out talking about peace then not as many people would be deceived by the Antichrist. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 through 8 tells us the mystery of iniquity. And this the, the Antichrist isn't going to show up until after the rapture of the church. But if there is material of of preaching and teaching against this Antichrist out there, then somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble could get a hold of that material and not be deceived. But people will be deceived by the mystery of iniquity. And the next mystery, number five, is the mystery of the body of Christ. In Ephesians 5.32, it says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Ephesians 3, 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So the church is what? The church is the body of Christ. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. There are many local churches, local assemblies of believers, uh, groups of believers gathered together, but there is one church, one body of Christ, made up of all born-again believers. You have the church at Corinth, the church of the Thessalonians, all that. And those are the local groups of believers but the church is made up of all born again believers and enemies of this mystery teach that there isn't one church but many different churches they believe each local assembly of believers is a body they say because the bible says the word churches 
more than the word church, there isn't that there isn't one big one church made up of believers, but a bunch of little churches. I'm not denying that the Bible talks about churches referring to groups of believers, but it also talks about the church that you are baptized into. And Ephesians 5.23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. And they will then say, Is there only one wife? There are many wives, so there is more than one church. But sure, there is more than one wife, and there is more than one church. But there is one church made up of every born-again believer. There is more than one wife, but there is one chaste virgin, which is the church, the bride of Christ. Second Corinthians 11.2 says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. There is one bride of Christ. There is one body of Christ. They would teach that the universal church or a uh, a church made up of all born-again believers is a Catholic teaching. So they'll say if you're teaching that all born-again believers make up the church, that you're teaching a Catholic doctrine. But the Bible is clear that all born-again believers are in the body of Christ. We're all members of the same body. Unfortunately, the self-proclaimed New Independent Fundamental Baptist movement teach this heresy as well that there is no body made up of every born again believer they deny that the 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 body of christ is all born again believers so they are enemies of this mystery as well so you can see why many many people are getting off into some serious false doctrine and people who believe you can lose your salvation are also enemies of this mystery if you can lose your salvation then the body of christ would have to be have to have part of its body amputated. John ten twenty eight says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John ten twenty nine says, My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So born-again believers can take this verse even further, because we aren't just in His hand, but we actually make up His, up his hand, because we're part of His body. And number six, we have the mystery of the rapture. And 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one through 55 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? First uh, Thessalonians four thirteen through 18 says, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, enemies of this mystery will put the body of Christ through the time of Jacob's trouble. The Bible is clear that the rapture happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. If you put the Christian in the time of Jacob's trouble, then you put him in a situation where he can take the mark of the beast. You put him in a situation where there is literal temple worship when the Christian's temple is his body. That's a huge difference. And that time period is called the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. You make a lot of contradictions when you put the born-again Christian in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's completely different. They put you in a time period where the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That causes us to completely cross dispensations because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And God has no physical temple today like he will in the time of Jacob's trouble. This also causes problems because if the church goes through the time of Jacob's trouble, they will be in danger of taking the mark of the beast, which causes all men to go to hell. And as I said before, 
Once you're saved, you're always saved, and nothing can make you lose your salvation. But if you were to go through the time of Jacob's trouble and take the mark, that verse says in Revelation 14, you're going to hell, and it don't matter how much you believed. So that's something different, and it's impossible for that to happen. We are still into the day of redemption. We're not going to be put in a situation to get the mark of the beast that would break that seal because it can't be broken. A faithful steward will teach the blessed hope, which is a rapture, before the time of Jacob's trouble, and this brings comfort to born-again Christians. Even though the post-trippers believe we are cowards for not wanting to face God's judgment on Israel and the rest of the Christ-rejecting world. That's our comfort. That's our blessed hope, the rapture. And they're not looking for Jesus Christ. They're looking for the Antichrist. A lot of things have, have to happen if before Jesus Christ comes back. If, if you're saying you're believing a pre-wrath, post-trib rapture. You're not looking for Jesus Christ. You're looking for all the things that's going to happen during that time, and you're looking for the Antichrist. But we're looking for Jesus Christ if you're a Bible believer. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're looking for that blessed hope. They're looking for the son of perdition to sit in the temple. And number seven, which I believe is the least important. If someone disagrees on this, I'm not going to say that they're a, a false teacher or anything. But it's Mystery Babylon the Great. It's Revelation 17, 5 says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And you find similarities between this mother of harlots and the Roman Catholic Church. If you read Revelation 17, you will see some interesting characteristics about this woman. This woman has a golden cup, just like the Catholics have a chalice. Her colors are purple and scarlet. You can go to Google, go to images, and type in Catholic Church, purple and scarlet. What do you see? Uh, she is also drunken with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. The Catholic, the Catholic Church, just like this woman, the great whore, drunken with the blood of the saints. The Catholic Church in history killed millions of Christians. Look up and read about it. You can read about it. Catholics also hate the Jews. The great whore will be a part of murdering the Jews. She is the mother of harlots and causes spiritual fornication. Just like how the Catholics are idolaters and worship statues in Mary. Uh, Babylon is a city that has a religion connected to it. Catholic Church is connected to Vatican City. We should be faithful in going against the Roman Catholic Church. It isn't just another denomination. It is a cult. And the Pope will be a major part in the time of Jacob's trouble. And some believe he's the Antichrist. Others believe he is the false prophet. But the Pope will be playing a major role in getting the nations together under a one world religion. And if a minister is faithful in preaching against the Roman Catholic Church, you will have more eyes open to the wickedness. And you will have more Bible believers be made. But because the Catholic Church are Bible rejectors, the Pope is their final authority, not the King James Bible. Many believe Babylon is USA. Many believe it is Israel. And I believe these theories don't make that person a false teacher or a heretic, but it takes the heat off the Catholic Church. And someone with a different view on who Babylon is, it isn't that serious to me. Like the other mysteries are very serious. But to say it is the Roman Catholic Church... It seems pretty clear that that's who it is. But interestingly, the new independent fundamental Baptist movement that you hear so much about of now, they are enemies to a good majority of these mysteries. They're, they're enemies to the blindness of, mystery of the blindness of Israel. They're wise in their own conceits, as it says in Romans eleven twenty five. It says, Brethren, that you should be, be not ignorant of this mystery, that you should be wise in your own conceits. So they're conceited. They don't believe that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Uh, they, ple they believe that God is done with Israel and he's only dealing with the church. And he, uh, that the church has replaced Israel. But, as I've told you before, God isn't completely done with Israel. The church is going to leave. We're going out in a rapture. 
God's going to go back to dealing with Israel in the time of Jacob's trouble. And this has caused them, they've got so deep into it that they've become anti-Semitic. And another enemy that they're, another mystery that they're the enemy of is the mystery of the body of Christ. They don't believe that all born again believers make up the body of Christ. They believe each congregation is a body. Uh, they are enemies to the mystery of the rapture. They believe in a pre post trib pre wrath rapture. And they also teach that USA is mystery Babylon, which takes away all the heat from the Catholic Church, which isn't as serious, but still they're teaching a lot of false doctrine and it's coming into probably your church. You may not even know about it. If your church if you have people in your church that are into the Bible at all, then there's most likely some of the men there that have got a hold of some bad doctrine from this group of people. And I mean, there's a lot of churches that they just go to church and they don't care about the Bible, they're just showing up. This doesn't really affect you as much. But that's still a fault because you need to be getting your people interested in the Bible. They need to be want, wanting to talk about the Bible, interested in Bible doctrine. They need to know about the King James issue. They need to know about all these just basic doctrines of the seven mysteries. If you used to go up to a random person at church and ask them what the seven mysteries are, they're just going to think you're talking about something crazy. They don't know that the Bible talks about mysteries. But you want to make sure that you're getting these things clear with people in your church and feed them the Word of God, not just milk. They need to know the doctrine. They need to know about the what's wrong with Israel, that they're blind in part. They need to know, like everybody knows, everybody will say, you know, we're going out before the tribulation, most people. But they don't know why. They know who the Antichrist is, they've heard of him, but they don't know what the Bible teaches about it. They know that they're once saved, always saved, but they don't know why. And it's because they're not being taught about these mysteries. But this has been enemies of the seven mysteries.